Now, Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has ordered the scrapping of two nuclear reactors which survived an earthquake and tsunami at Fukushima. Prime Minister has, Abe has been visiting the plant at Fukushima. He's called for all leaks of contaminated water to be fixed within six months. But he says he stands by his reassurance that Tokyo is safe to host the 2020 Olympic Games. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has called on the company in charge of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant to scrap all reactors, including the two that were not severely damaged by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. There are six reactors at Fukushima Daiichi. Four of them are already set to be dismantled. Local community leaders have been urging TEPCO to also scrap the other two. Prime Minister Abe inspected the plant on Thursday. He said he echoed the request in a meeting with TEPCO executives. I urged TEPCO executives to dismantle the number five and six reactors to concentrate their work on dealing with a series of problems, including leaking radioactive water. The TEPCO officials told NHK the company is taking the Prime Minister's request seriously and will decide what to do by the end of the year. Abe instructed the company to set the deadline to decontaminate radioactive water that is being stored at the site. 400 tons of groundwater seeps into the damaged buildings on the Fukushima Daiichi compound and get contaminated every day. Abe said TEPCO's president Naomi Hirose told him the company plans to decontaminate the water by March 2015. Let's tell you more about the two reactors Prime Minister Abe was talking about. There are, uh, they are reactors 5 and 6, which had operated for 30 years before the accident. They were the last units to be installed at the plant. Both reactors were offline for safety inspections at the time of the March 2011 accident. They were hit by the earthquake and tsunami, but did not melt down because an emergency electricity system kept them cool. TEPCO officials say both reactors are still cool and stable. TEPCO has yet another problem on their hands. The company says it's found cracks in the brace supporting an exhaust pipe at the plant. Authorities are concerned it could collapse if there's another earthquake. The 120 meter tall pipe stands between two reactor buildings. Workers used it to release radioactive vapors and prevent an explosion after the disaster. TEPCO officials say they spotted cracks in eight places on the steel brace that holds the pipe upright. They suspect the earthquake two years ago caused the problem. They say there is no evidence of any damage to the pipe itself. Overseers at the Nuclear Regulation Authority are demanding that company officials investigate immediately. They want to know whether the structure can withstand another earthquake. Meanwhile, a senior government official is pledging transparency about Japan's nuclear facilities. Yosuke Isozaki is an advisor to Prime Minister Abe. He was speaking about the bill concerning the protection of national secrets. It would classify any information that could significantly damage national security as a special secret. Government officials and other individuals who leak such information could face up to 10 years in prison. Isozaki said that the government would never designate information about the country's nuclear plants as special secrets. The government aims to have the bill enacted before the end of the year.
In light of the events at Fukushima Daiichi, Japan's government established the Nuclear Regulation Authority. Thursday marks one year since the organization began operations. In that time, regulators have drawn up new safety standards and conducted surveys on active seismic faults at other nuclear plants in the country. But as NHK World's Noriko Okada reports, some people say the NRA is not doing enough. Members of a diet panel surveying the Fukushima Daiichi accident denounced what was then the country's regulatory body, the Nuclear and Industrial Safety Agency. They said officials were in the power of the companies they were meant to supervise. Government leaders launched a new regulatory body, independent of the government and the power industry. They named it the Nuclear Regulation Authority. The authority's first major task was to evaluate the safety of the country's commercial nuclear plants. Experts have been conducting a survey on active seismic faults beneath the plant. They confirmed the existence of an active fault under the number two reactor at the Tsuruga plant in Fukui prefecture. The authority has reiterated that reactors cannot be allowed to restart unless their safety is confirmed. The NRA has also adopted new guidelines to be followed by operators of nuclear power plants. Under these new rules, the utilities are required to prepare for all kinds of serious accidents. We have come up with a rather thorough set of requirements that are tough even by international standards. But I believe the true worth of these safety requirements will hinge on the actual inspections. The authority is, however, under fire for its unclear response to recent contaminated water leaks from the damaged Fukushima nuclear power plant. Professor Jota Kanda has been studying the issue. He says there is nothing to show that the authority is spearheading efforts to settle the problem of contaminated water leaks. Observing the way they are handling the issue of contaminated water, it looks like a dual administration by the NRA and the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, which oversees electric power plants. And the NRA itself does not appear to be assuming a leading role in the issue. Most NRA employees once worked for its predecessor, which was criticized for its lack of expertise in nuclear plant operation. Experts are calling on the authority to elevate its level of expertise. The safety of all nuclear facilities in Japan lies on the shoulders of these officials. Noriko Okada, NHK World. Japanese food makers are pitching their products at a food fair in Sao Paulo in an attempt to expand their market in Brazil. Some 700 firms and 50,000 buyers from across the world are taking part in one of South America's largest trade fairs. Eight Japanese food companies and organizations are showcasing miso, fermented soybean paste, green tea and other products. Among these is a sake brewer from Fukushima Prefecture, an area devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. I want Brazilians to know that sake production has resumed in the disaster hit areas and that Fukushima sake is ready to enjoy. I'd like to serve various kinds of sake so that more customers can try the Japanese beverage. Brazil has the world's largest population of people of Japanese descent outside of Japan. An increasing number of Japanese beverage makers and restaurants are setting up shop in the country. When I was watching the uh, big picture last night, you were talking about this Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yes. Could you talk more about that and what the different elements of it were? Well, here's one of the problems. Yeah. We don't know. Uh, we, we've had, I've had two members of Congress on this program Actually, several. Uh, Bernie Sanders has talked about this. Sherrod Brown has talked about this. Peter DeFazio has talked about this. And Alan Grayson has talked about this all on this, on this program. Two senators, two members of the House of Representatives. None of them can get a draft copy of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The White House is holding it in secret. It is being negotiated 
between a bunch of in a, you know in a room with with a, about a little over a hundred organizations represented other than the countries themselves and it's only the executive branches of the countries and it's countries like you know the Philippines and China and Japan and who knows I don't know it's a bunch of countries you know along the Pacific Rim and us other than them it's mostly transnational corporations and uh, it's being debated in complete privacy and quiet and secrecy and Obama has already said that he intends to seek track fast track authority Fast Track was a, uh, a, a rule or a way of passing legislation that I think is unconstitutional that was put into place in 1974 at the request of Richard Nixon where uh, the president could present legislation to Congress and say, take it or leave it, and if you take it, it only takes a majority vote, but there's limited debate and there's no ability to amend. It either passes or it doesn't, and this was done for trade agreements. And trade agreements, according to the Constitution, trade agreements, in fact, where is my little Constitution? I, I, I've lost it someplace. Here it is. Uh, according to the Constitution, it's, you know, it, it is Congress that has the right to regulate trade between the United States and other countries. I mean, here it is. Article 1, Section 8, Number 3. Uh, Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. So, and, and in fact, it goes on, and I'd have to dig a little bit to find where, but it says that um, if Congress is negotiating treaties, let's see, treaties are in here. I'll have to look for it. Anyway, the treaties require a supermajority. They require two-thirds. And, uh, yeah, they, they require two-thirds of the, uh, and, but, so they're calling this thing a trade agreement rather than a treaty, even though a treaty is an agreement between us and another country. They're calling it a trade agreement so it can be passed by majority vote rather than two-thirds. And this is what they do with sneaky legislation that they don't want people to know about and they don't want there to be a debate on. And this is where I think this administration is going to get you know, kicked in the teeth on this thing uh, or the shins or you know, whatever the metaphor is you want to use. Apparently what it's going to do is it's going to lower our standards for food safety. It's going to lower our standards for pharmaceutical safety. It's going to um, make patent protections more favorable to giant corporations. It's going to, it, may, it may mess with the Internet. Um, a lot of it has nothing to do with international trade. It has to do with business standards. This is not a good thing, and we need to be mobilizing against it and getting ready. Because when the Obama administration rolls this thing out, they're, frankly, I think that a lot of the Tea Partiers are going to be objecting to it, too, on their constitutional grounds, because this is a violation of the Constitution. So, Norma, that's pretty much all I know about it. Everything I do know about it, I don't like. And uh, uh, publiccitizen.org has a, uh, a spinoff called, I think, Global Trade Watch. Lori Wallach is the president of it. And they have quite a bit of information over on their website. So. Well, I appreciate this. Well, I sure. was trying to read what you had on the screen last night. It said something about ban Buy America policies. Yes, it would make it illegal for any nation to have nationalistic uh, purchasing policies. Well, that sound, sounds to me like an interference with free speech also, because I'm constantly telling people to find something made in America. Yeah. Buy America, because this is the only vote the consumer has. It doesn't matter who we elect. We don't really have a vote in what we elect because they don't work for us. <clears throat> and the only vote Thanks we have the Court. is trying to use our money to buy an American product to force them to bring the companies back. Yeah. Because as far as I'm concerned, a company that's based overseas is no longer an American company, and they don't deserve any kind of consideration or tax breaks. Yeah, I, I agree. Norma, well said. Thank you very much for the call. Japan's economic revitalization minister is hoping to set up a national strategic zone to promote the exports of agricultural products. Akira Amadi expressed his hope during a visit to an area known as Food Valley in the Netherlands. This area is crowded with 1,500 food-related businesses and agricultural research institutes. It has enabled the Netherlands to become the world's second largest agricultural exporter in value, right behind the U.S. Japan's agricultural products are rated high overseas, but the country is not aggressive enough in promoting them. Amadi said he wants to see Japan also create a base to help push exports of farm produce that the global market wants. 
Free trade negotiators under the Trans-Pacific Partnership are exploring ways now to speed up their talks. They're aiming to reach a deal by the end of the year. Top officials of the 12 participating nations, including the United States and Japan, gathered for a four-day meeting which started on Wednesday. They talked about how to move the discussions forward more quickly at the task force level. That covers different topics. For less contentious areas, they decided to instruct trade delegates of the member countries to wrap up their negotiations uh, by the TPP summit in Bali, Indonesia next month. For sensitive and challenging fields, the chief negotiators agreed to clarify issues this week and put them up for further discussions during the summit. These areas include removal of tariffs on agricultural and industrial products, as well as setting rules to protect patents and copyrights. North Korea's chief nuclear negotiator says his country is ready to resume long-stalled six-party talks on its nuclear program. First Vice Foreign Minister Kim Kye-gwan is calling for a restart of negotiations without any preconditions. Kim was speaking at a symposium on North Korea's nuclear program in Beijing. It's being attended by some 50 officials and researchers from the six countries involved in the talks. We support the talks and are willing to resume dialogue, including small-scale discussions within that framework. The talks were suspended nearly five years ago. Kim criticized the United States for saying it wants North Korea to take steps toward denuclearization before it's willing to resume dialogue. On Wednesday, Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshida Suga reiterated Japan's position on the issue. We will work closely with our allies, including the U.S. and South Korea, to tell North Korea that it must first fully implement what was previously agreed at the six-party talks, as well as the U.N. Security Council resolution. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi is chairing the talks. In his opening remarks, he said maintaining the six-party process is a practical and effective means of denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. This latest development comes a day after diplomatic sources told NHK North Korea tested an engine that could be used in a new type of intercontinental ballistic missile. It was recently on display at a military parade. Last week, a team of American researchers said they had reason to suspect Pyongyang has restarted a nuclear reactor that's capable of making weapons-grade plutonium. 